every Raspberry Pi cluster I build, someone always comments, Jeff, you dummy, nobody's going to run one of these things in production. Well, maybe. I mean, when I showed off this thing running a Ceph storage cluster, it wasn't the fastest thing in the world. And it wasn't quite stable either, come to think of it. But in that video, I also mentioned the Mars 400, an actual enterprise storage cluster. And you know what? I talked to Embedded, and they sent me one. And the fact I have this thing running proves the skills I learned from my dinky little $500 Pi cluster are actually valuable. I was able to take this storage appliance built with eight individual ARM nodes, very much like the six on the Super 6C, and built a bulletproof Ceph storage cluster on it. But this thing goes way deeper than my Pi cluster. Each ARM node has four gigs of RAM and 128 gig SSD. Up front, there's a full hard drive bay, one for each node. And over here, dual redundant power supplies. And back here, this is my favorite part of this whole box. There are dual redundant network switches connecting everything together. What does all that mean? You can have node failures, power supply failures, even multiple network switch failures, and this machine will just keep chugging along. Who needs this? Well, not your average home lab. But more and more businesses are adopting Ceph for hugely scalable network storage, and these machines are like cockroaches, but in a good way. I mean, they sure look a lot sexier. <laughs> look at that beautiful color on the front. But before we get too deep into the server, I thought I should mention this video's sponsor, Twingate. I've been testing the server on and off for a few months, and while I was away, I needed remote access. Sure, I have my own VPN, but earlier this year, Network Chuck showed me Twingate. Twingate's different than a VPN. What I love is how easy it is to control access to different devices or services running on my own network. Let's say I want to open up access just to the web UI running on this Mars 400 to an engineer for remote debugging. With Twingate, I can do that easily. Or if I want to set up my network so my wife can only access Jellyfin or Plex from her phone anywhere, that's easy too. I used the free plan here, and all I needed to do was run a Docker container on one of my Raspberry Pis, then I could use that to tunnel in access to anything on my network, but with fine-grained access control. And they have client apps for everything. Windows, Linux, Mac, iOS, Android, even Chrome OS. Twingate won't magically give you sysadmin superpowers, but in some ways it sure feels like it. I still love my personal VPN, but I've added Twingate to my tool belt, and I'm happy to recommend it to you too. Use the link in the description and get Twingate free for up to five users. The hardware specs on the Mars 400 seem modest on the surface. I mean, there are eight computers packed into this thing. And just like a Raspberry Pi, there's just not room for hundreds of cores or terabytes of RAM on a computer this small. Each of these little modules has a quad-core ARM A72 chip, four gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of eMMC, dual 2.5 gig ethernet, a SATA SSD in this M.2 slot, and another SATA bay for a hard drive up front. And that's actually perfect for a little low-power Ceph node. Individually, it's not a lot, but if you lump eight of these together, that gives you enough for a three-node cluster of Ceph monitors and then five OSDs. The monitors store a redundant mapping for all the data in the cluster, and the OSDs store all your data and make sure none of it can ever disappear or get corrupt. It's like RAID, but even more resilient. And you can scale it up to petabytes with multiple machines. In each of these nodes, they only use about 5 watts of power. So this whole system, hard drives and all, idles under 100 watts. That's all well and good, but it better put out more than like 50 megs per second, or what's the point of using this thing over my Pi cluster? But there's one of the major differences. Instead of just one port of 1 gigabit networking, these nodes all have dual 2.5 gig network interfaces. And that's helpful because these two switches back here give me two fully independent networks. A public network that I can use to store things on the cluster, and a private network just for Ceph for better security and performance. Each switch back here has two 10 gig interfaces, and you can either use SFP Plus or RJ45, your choice. There's also a BMC port, the last one on the right. The BMC, or board management controller, is for out of band management. You can connect to the server and manage the thing over the network, like if you want to control the fan speeds or restart a node. And that's all managed by this fancy Nuvaton chip with its own little ARM CPU. You'll notice that there isn't a USB port or VGA or anything like that. These servers are meant to be completely headless. Everything you do is over the network. The power supplies are hot swappable and redundant, meaning I can yank power on one and the server will go on its merry way. Each power supply can do 300 watts, though the whole system won't draw that much, so there's a lot of headroom. Up front, there are these eight SATA hard drive bays. Their little trays let you mount either full-size 3.5-inch drives or smaller 2.5-inch drives. 
but it's all SATA. There's no SAS or NVMe up front. If you want that, you need to upgrade to one of their other Mars machines. They have the Mars 500 with an Ampere CPU, or the Mars 524 with dual Ampere Ultra CPUs. Those things are monsters with 8 or 24 NVMe hot swap bays. But in my opinion, none of those are quite as good looking as the old 400. Covering up all the storage inside is this vibrant faceplate with node status LEDs, an ID LED, and two buttons, reset and power. But again, there's no front panel USB here, just power and reset. This thing is meant to be headless. You deploy it in a rack somewhere, then you never really look at it or touch it again unless you need to hot swap a drive or some spare part. To keep everything cool, there's a set of PWM fans, and I thought they'd be super loud, but they aren't that bad, and you can turn down the fan speed in the BMC if you want. It doesn't get that hot, but that's the nice thing about the power efficiency running ARM CPUs. It's a lot easier to keep eight 5 watt nodes cool than it is a single 200 watt monster CPU. And that's all well and good, but it's useless if it doesn't perform. And before we get to performance, I need to actually get this thing running. If you're not used to buying new enterprise gear, it's not cheap the same way a Pi cluster is. You can buy one on Newegg for 3,500 bucks, but that's just the server. If you want support, you gotta pony up. That's because this isn't really a server per se, it's an enterprise storage appliance. Keyword being appliance. It's not the same as buying a used server on eBay and slapping Proxmox on it. This thing comes with a support plan, licensing, and extensive documentation, and it assumes you're going to run Embedded's configuration on it. And it's documented very well. Everything from unboxing, to assembly, to configuring your network, it's all in the guides. For my testing, I decided to just use an aggregated setup where all the nodes are connected through a single 10 gigabit network port. Like I mentioned earlier though, the two switches each have two 10 gig ports, and you could bond the ports to get 20 gigabits of redundant traffic. But in my case, my home network is only 10 gig, so I'm going to stick with that and forego the extra redundancy too, just for testing. But basically, if you're setting one of these up for yourself, read the guide. I followed their recommendation though and set up three monitor nodes and five OSDs. The OSDs have storage attached, so I installed five hard drives for nodes 1 to 5. The monitor nodes don't need hard drives, so I left the 3 bays for 6, 7, and 8 empty. Like I said, the hard drives go on these little trays and you just slide them into place. There's a little gap underneath and around the drives for airflow, but there isn't any vibration dampening. These servers are not meant to be portable, they're for permanent rack mount installs only. For the software, you either need to set aside 8 or 16 IP addresses, one or two for each node. You can set up your network so the Ceph backend traffic is separated from the client storage traffic, or put it all together like I did. Now, I talked to the embedded engineers, and they wanted to point out they recommend a minimum of three of these servers in any serious production environment for maximum performance and even more redundancy. But I just have the one server, which is fine by me. The system management is done through this BMC, and you can turn on and off individual nodes or the whole cluster. You can control fan speeds and get chassis info, and you can even reset everything to factory defaults, but just be careful doing that. And once it's up and you have networking set up, you can visit any node and log in to Universe Store, Embedded's cluster management interface. I followed along with their documentation to set up the first monitor or mon node. I decided to put it on node 1, and wait, is that Ansible? That, that is Ansible! How fun is that? It looks like Ambed had built in their own integrated Ansible engine to manage the Ceph cluster, and well, that makes sense. I mean, Ansible has a lot of support for Ceph built in. And when you're configuring complex software on clusters with a lot of computers, Ansible's my favorite tool. I mean, it's not like I wrote a whole book on it or anything. Check out Ansible for DevOps and get a free copy using the link below. But that's cool, and I love how they give you all the output right in the UI. Anyway, I got distracted. I created the first monitor node, which means Ceph can manage the cluster now, and Embedded recommends you have at least three monitors for redundancy. So I created two other ones, then I waited while Ansible did its thing. And after that, I had to pause a bit. UVS needs a license to do some tasks, like set up the actual storage nodes, so I generated a license request and sent that off to Embedded. While I was waiting, I noticed there was an error in one of their FAQ pages, so I also filed a support ticket for that. It was fixed up just a couple days later, so I'm happy to report their support process works well, even for little things. After they sent my license, I inserted it and moved on to creating OSDs, which are Ceph Object Storage Daemons. They basically handle the actual storage and replication of data. And that's when I realized I had set up the monitor nodes as 1, 2, and 3, and I had hard drives in those nodes, but not in 6, 7, and 8. So I shut things down to swap the drives, and when I was moving them I noticed you should be careful unplugging a drive in a chassis like this. 
If you pull the drive too hard and the drive slams into something metal, that jolts really bad for a big mechanical hard drive. So I used both hands to carefully slide each drive out when I was moving them. But I got that done, booted back up, and created the OSDs again. And then I realized all these drives had partitions on them. They're, they're actually drives I used in one of my NAS testing videos, and I didn't realize the Mars 400 had a built-in way to erase all the disks, so I had pulled them all again, wiped them using a Raspberry Pi, and rebooted a third time. No, none of this would be an issue if I just used brand new drives, which is probably a good idea if you're setting up fancy new storage servers like these. Regardless, I finally could get the OSDs going, and now it's Ceph's time to shine. I created a Ceph file system, and what's cool about Linux is you can just mount a Ceph file system on any Linux box, like any other kind of volume. You just need a secret key for authentication, which the UVS interface kindly provides here. I was going to try mounting it through a Linux Docker container on my Mac, but I couldn't, so I hopped over to my Raspberry Pi instead. I mounted the volume, and look, it's there, all running over my network back to five separate hard drives spread across five different nodes inside the Mars 400. So right away I wanted to benchmark this thing. Surely it can max out the Pi's piddly gigabit Ethernet. And it did. Using 4 megabyte block sizes, I was seeing an average around 114 megabytes per second, which is right around the line speed of a gigabit connection. But I wanted to go all the way. I mean, this thing has four 10 gig connections on the back. Surely it can pass a gigabit. But I realized since my workshop is a wreck right now, seriously, my workbench is full, this other workbench is full, and well, everything's full. Plus I have this measly one gigabit switch over here because I had to pull my 10 gig switch for testing. <laughs> Can you see why I'm excited to be moving to the new office? But I decided to pull out my 10 gig server I used to use for TrueNAS and I popped Ubuntu on it. I used a DAC or direct attach cable to jack it straight into the 10 gig switch next to the Mars and then got to testing stuff from it. And for 4K random writes, I got around 700 IOPS. And for 4 meg random writes, just under 200 megabytes per second. So not quite double the performance I could get through my Pi over that gigabit switch, but still pretty good for a cluster of five spinning hard drives all running over the network. And for reads, it was funny, FIO kept reporting 50,000 IOPS, but I think Ceph's UI was a bit more realistic, around 2K. And throughout all that testing, I checked on power consumption. Powered off, the Mars 400 used about 5 watts, and at idle, around 70. Full blast, doing 4K random writes, I saw it hover around 145 watts. So it's not sipping power like a Nook or a single Raspberry Pi, but I mean, it is eight computers, two multi-gig switches, and five hard drives. And noise isn't bad either, it's quieter than most enterprise 1U and 2U gear, but those fans are pretty bog standard server fans. They're not made to be quiet, and you can turn them down a bit if you're okay with things getting slightly hotter. For spinning hard drives though, I'd rather take the hit on noise. Backblaze is studying whether hotter drives fail more often, but I'd venture to say it's better to not tempt fate unless you love swapping hard drives. So there you have it. This cluster doesn't scream like an all-flash cluster, either in IOPS or with how loud it is, but that's why Embedded also makes the Mars 500 and 524. They've studied incorporating multiple tiers of storage and caching to get eye-watering network storage throughput. And here's the thing. The whole reason I reached out to Embed in the first place. Ceph is complicated, and clustering is complicated. And there are more and more clusters out there doing high-performance computing, or HPC, and storage, and all that stuff. Ten years ago, you might see some giant NASes or something like an EMC rack server for a company or hospital or something. But nowadays, it seems like every company is deploying clustered storage solutions, whether it's with appliances like these or custom builds. And if you want to learn about it, what better way than with these little mini versions sipping less than 50 watts right next to you on your desk? That's why I love playing with Pi clusters. And that's why I love this Mars 400. It takes the idea of a Pi cluster and turns it into production-ready enterprise gear. It shows the base architecture is sound. It adds on redundancy, management, and a beautiful enclosure. But at its heart, it's not that much different than my little Pi cluster. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.